WordPress Accessibility Day 2023. Go beyond checklists to build a great course learning experience with speaker Sandy Goddard, web developer and educator, CMS Web Solutions. This presentation was recorded September 27th, 2023. All right. All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, again, welcome or welcome back to uh, WordPress Accessibility Day 2023. I'm Ben O'Gilvie, Head of Accessibility at ArcTouch. We help companies uh, of all sizes create lovable custom apps, websites, and connected experiences used by hundreds of millions of people every day. And I help our teams do that work with an accessibility-first approach. Thank you all so much for joining Go Beyond Checklists to build a great course learning experience with Sandy Gowder. As a web accessibility specialist, Sandy has been developing modern, accessible websites for over 15 years. She also coaches designers, developers, and content producers on best practices for meeting web, web accessibility guidelines. She has led workshops for businesses, municipalities, and web development firms on web accessibility and the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, or AODA. She has spoken at conferences and appeared at web accessibility expert webinars. Sandy has developed curriculum and taught web content and social media accessibility at Mohawk College as part of the former Accessible Media Production Graduate Certificate Program. Management and technical audiences welcome her clear, common sense approach. During the ses session today, please add your questions in the Zoom Q&A section, and we'll answer them at the end of the session. And you can also use the chat section to connect with other attendees. And with that, I'll hand over to Sandy. Thanks, Ben. And thanks to everyone who uh, has welcomed me to join you here today. So I am going to get my screen sharing working here. Moment. Okay, can I get a thumbs up if everyone's seeing that okay? Not yet. Black screen at the moment for me. Yeah, there yeah. it says it's still loading. So, okay. I don't have a song and dance for you folks, I'm afraid. <laughs> I wasn't planning on technology um, failing on me. So, yeah. Loading. I feel like I should be playing the Jeopardy song right now. There we go. Okay, I'm seeing a bunch of thumbs up floating. So I think we are in business. Okay, so let's get started. So what are we going to cover today? So just in a nutshell, two things that I want to talk about. Um, look at some best practices for creating accessible learning content and cover some basic principles of UDL or Universal Design for Learning and how to apply UDL to your learning content. Now, UDL is a big subject, which is why we're just going to be touching on some of the very basics uh, today. But before we get into anything, uh, I want to do a quick poll. Um, so you can either take a snapshot of the QR code on the screen that should get you to the poll, uh, or you can visit https colon forward slash forward slash menti, M E N T I dot com slash A L I Z H 9 P 5 J I. 5B. And if somebody can drop that into the chat, that would be super great. <laughs> uh, so this is just a simply a quick poll. What kind of organization do you work for? Um, to take a couple of minutes to answer that, and then we'll move on. And we should as people start completing the poll, start seeing some of your responses showing up on the screen. So the five types of organizations, education. So do you work for elementary, post-secondary uh, businesses or small business or some other organization? Maybe you're a freelancer or self-employed. And I suspect that my technology is going to fail me here. Um, so let's imagine that people are answering this slide. And what all the purpose of this is just to get a sense of uh, who is here, what kind of organizations you're working for, 
um, just to give a sense for both you and me uh, who's here. But unfortunately, my technology is not going to work for me, so I'm just going to move right on. So when we talk about accessibility and digital accessibility or web accessibility, we really need to think about the basics. And many of the presenters today have talked about WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And those are re that's really a good um, set of guidelines to get started with just about anything that has to do with digital accessibility. The principles are really sound and they're there to help guide us on how to create um, accessible content and accessible websites. So if you are posting any kind of learning content to um, WordPress, start with an accessible WordPress theme. I mean, it, that's a given. Um, there are themes out there in the repository that you can use. Um, and as long as you maintain um, that theme and choose accessible color combinations, which I'm sure people have talked about earlier today, um, you're, you're starting with a good foundation. It's also important to organize your content. Your learning content might be in a learning management system. It could be a recorded webinar like what we're doing today, um, or it could be a series of pages on a website um, that have content in them. So to help all of our learners, it's important to organize the content, uh, use headings where they're appropriate, use proper heading structure. Um, to break up long chunks of text. It really makes things a lot easier for our learners to digest. And it is a given. If you've got images in your content, make sure that you include alternative text for those images. Be descriptive. Um, make sure that you're um, explaining what the picture is about. It doesn't need to be too wordy, but it does need to convey the, the intent of the image that you're including in your content. And of course, caption your videos, provide audio transcripts, and don't just rely on automated captioning. Um, they're a great place to start. They can save you some time, but make sure that you go back and actually edit the, the captions or the transcripts to make sure they're accurate to what you've said in any of your recorded content. And even better, and this is, this is taking things to an even um, higher level, include audio description or described video for all the audio and video content or provide a described video text. So I'm going to show you uh, a bit later in the session uh, a couple of examples of that. But really what it means is describing what's happening on the screen for somebody who can't see the screen. It could be because they're blind and they, they can't see the screen, or maybe they're listening to your content while they're cooking dinner and they don't have the uh, screen in front of them. It can be helpful for a lot of different users to describe what's actually going on on the screen. We talked about using alternative text for images, and that's an important place to start, to start. but it's also great if you can start incorporating inclusive imagery in your content. Um, so inclusive imagery uh, includes images that portray disability. Um, and there's different ways of doing that. There's more and more uh, image libraries out there that uh, have images that are inclusive. And it's important to try to incorporate that um, into your content. It doesn't need to be um, inspiration form. You don't want to show uh, people with a disability and present them as heroes. You want to present them in normal circumstances, like the image that I've chosen for this particular slide. It's, <laughs> pardon me, it's a gentleman sitting on a bench. Um, he's got his laptop open. He's got a cup of coffee sitting next to him on the bench, and he just happens to have a prosthetic leg. So that's a an, a nice way to incorporate an inclusive image without turning it into um, a hero. Um, and the other thing to think about is this whole concept of the Scully effect. There was a television show back in the day called The X-Files. <clears throat> and it was a show uh, with two FBI agents. And one of them was a female FBI agent named Scully. And she was one of the first women, <clears throat> pardon me, to be shown uh, on TV with a science background, you know, quite intelligent and quite uh, highly skilled. 
And after that show aired, schools were starting to notice that more and more women or young girls were getting involved or interest, interested in STEM programs, so science, technology, engineering, and math. They saw her doing it, and they thought, well, if she can do it, then I can do it. So we, it's, called, it's now called the Scully effect. And it's when we see um, people like us, we can, it's easier for us to relate, right? And if we can relate, then we're more easy to, we're likely to become more interested in the topic or interested in the website or whatever the case may be. So see if you can find any images that um, portray disabilities in a positive light and use them appropriately. Plain language. <clears throat> I think a couple of the other presenters have touched on this a bit. Plain language is important for learning. And plain language is not about dumbing down content. There's this misconception that plain language is all about making things super simple and, um, you know, <laughs> pardon me, easier for, you know, lowering the grade level. And yes, we are trying to get to a lower grade level uh, with our content, but it's not about dumbing down content. It's about making it easier for people to digest the content, understand the content, and absorb the content. It helps make learning much more effective. It helps make learning much more efficient. If you're presented with two pieces of um, text and one is written in plain language, it's nicely organized, it might have some bullet points, or you're presented with that same content and it's a 15 page essay using really big words, you're probably going to gravitate to the first one with the plain language and the bullet points and the headings. It's just easier to absorb. We're all busy people. We all like to get in and get out, learn things quickly, read things quickly. We don't, our focus um, is not like it used to be because of this world of technology that we live in. So using plain language, it can be very effective and very helpful. And there's lots of tools out there that can help you take your content and make it a little bit easier to read. So there's things like the Hemingway app at HemingwayApp.com. <clears throat> There's Microsoft Word has um, built-in tools that can help you check the reading level and statistics in your app uh, or in your content. <clears throat> and artificial intelligence can be a real uh, help for this kind of thing. So something like a chat GPT, as long as you ask it, <coughs> pardon me, sorry, interpreters, um, as long as you are asking the question in the right way or using the right prompt, like rephrase this original sentence using plain language, or maybe you ask chat GPT to divide this paragraph into sentences. And it might not be perfect, but it's going to get you close. Paint a picture. So first of all, don't assume that everyone can see your screen. So again, it could be somebody who's blind and literally cannot see the screen, or it could be somebody who's trying to listen to your content, your learning content, but they don't have the screen in front of them. So describe the content on the screen. Paint the picture with um, words uh, so that you can convey the intent of the content. If you're using images, use images that support the content, not just putting them there because they're decorative. So in this particular case, on this slide, I've chosen a picture of someone wearing a blue button-down shirt, their hands, they've got a paintbrush in one hand, a pen in another, and they are covered in all sorts of paint. They're obviously very messy artists, but they're, they are um, painting a picture with these tools. The other thing to do, um, and this one can be difficult to uh, undo a habit, is using terms like, as you can see, or as you can hear. Um, not everybody can see and not everybody can hear. So try to find ways that um, 
talk about what's on your screen without using terms like that. <clears throat> okay, universal design for learning. As I mentioned at the beginning, it's a big subject. There's a lot to it. it it's almost like um, a walk egg in that it can be feel really complex and really big and hard to digest. But what I want to cover today is just some few top level things for you to consider. And even if you only pick one thing and try working on that, that's great. So what is it all about? <clears throat> the UDL guidelines uh, provide a framework to improve and optimize teaching and learning for all people. And you can get all the information at udlguidelines.caft.org. And there's really three guiding principles. You provide a multiple means of engagement. So that supports the why of learning. Why are we doing this? Provide multiple means of representation. So what are we learning? And provide multiple means of action and expression. So how? How are we doing the learning? And I'm going to cover each one of these um, as we move forward. So provide multiple means of engagement. Find different ways for your learners to get involved. So that could be including a variety of activities, um, like my failed attempt at a Mentimeter. In case you were wondering why I was doing that, that's an example of how you include activities uh, to get people engaged. And some people might like a mentee, some people might not, but it's there for people who do like that sort of thing. So we try to include different ways for people to engage with the content, um, including interaction with others. So there's been a lot of that going on today in the chat. That's great, that's, that's a way of engaging. So if you're doing webinars, encourage that kind of conversation. Um, maybe you have a Slack channel specific to your learning, um, or you have a blog post that's ongoing. <clears throat> There's different ways to do it, and it all depends on what it is that you are trying to teach people and what best suits your particular audience. And the other thing to do is include the same content in different formats. So when I was showing slides with text on it, the images that I was choosing supported the text so that uh, somebody who's a visual learner could look at the image and say, oh yeah, I kind of get what she's talking about, kind of reinforces the content that I'm trying to share with you today. So the next slide is gonna be a very short um, uh, video clip. It, there are uh, captions on it, um, but there's also a transcript available uh, at a11y.school forward slash capital W, capital P, a11y slash inaccessible text. So for those of you who don't want to watch the video, feel free to grab that um, transcript and read along. Okay. This clip is inaccessible. So now we've got two things on our screen right now. We have the website that we're working on uh, on the left and on the right is some basic HTML. So you'll see I have uh, my code editor open with a document and there's lots of HTML in there already. But what we want to do is add a little bit more structure to the site. So the first thing we want to do is take a look at this menu that we've got here. <clears throat> so there is a couple of things in there that I touched on uh, earlier. Um, and even Jenison actually talked about the whole idea of left and right. Jenison, if you saw the, the keynote this morning, talked about that. Left and right means nothing. Um, in the context of digital accessibility for Genesis, for somebody who is blind. Um, so I'm talking about something being on the left of the screen and the right of the screen. I talked about, as you can see, well, not everybody can see what's on the screen. So that's um, a pretty, a snip of a pretty typical video lesson. 
whether it's something that's being shared from a high school classroom or a webinar that we've recorded. We do this all the time and uh, it's not necessarily the best way to do it. This is, yeah, oops, sorry. There we go. <clears throat> the next part of UDL talks about multiple means of representation. So find different ways for learners to access your content. And I've been doing that by providing a video transcript as well as showing the video. So if you want to read the transcript and that works better for you, then that the content is there. It's the exact same content. If you'd rather watch the video, then I'm presenting it to you in a video. So when multiple means of representation is really about finding different ways to give your learners um, content, um, obviously making sure that the content is accessible in whatever way that you are providing it, but provide it in different ways. We all learn differently. We all um, have a preferred way of doing things. Um, so give that opportunity to your students as well. And also look for different ways to check your learner's understanding. <clears throat> it could be um, a quick conversation in a classroom or a classroom setting. It could be a quick chat in a Zoom webinar. Um, again, it could be a chat in something like Slack. So think about how you can use different ways to deliver information and also to check understanding. So I'm gonna show another clip. Um, Again, the, the transcript is available at a11y.school slash WPA11y slash accessible text. This clip is accessible. Great, so now that we've switched screens, uh, we have our website on the left side of the screen. Uh, and this website has, it's pretty basic. We have some uh, menu with home, about, history, contact, uh, heading that says welcome to our website, some text with a link out to Wake 2.1 and a cat that's taken an accidental selfie. This little white cat is staring up at the phone with great big eyes. Clearly it found the selfie button and seems to be pretty confused by what he's done. Cute all in all. And on the right side of the screen, we have the HTML that is used to create the website. So at the top of the screen, uh, the HTML is pretty standard. We have the doc type um, that says uh, angle bracket exclamation doc type HTML close angle bracket and that tells the browser that this is an HTML document and it needs to think about it that way. Okay, so it's better than the first one. I've been much more descriptive in this video. I have described the cat with the accidental selfie. I didn't even touch on that in the first video. <clears throat> I started talking about all the HTML code that's in the HTML document. Um, and really when you're, you're doing something, especially something that's technically related, you're gonna have to find a balance between saying every single character that's on the screen um, and maybe finding shortcuts, like saying that remember to open and close your tags. Um, rather than saying open angle bracket, close angle bracket for every line of HTML. So that's something that you will need to kind of adapt to your kind of content. Um, but keep in mind that um, not everybody's going to be watching you type on the screen. So if you're typing something, say it out loud. And that's what integrated describe video is all about. It's describing what's happening on the screen. It's almost listening, like listening to a baseball game. <clears throat> My husband and I are big Toronto Blue Jays fans. Um, we listen quite often on the radio. And radio announcers for baseball are really good at describing not just what's happening on the playing field, but what's happening around the players and in the stadium itself. So think of yourself as a baseball announcer on the radio, and that can give you some clues or hints as to how to kind of move forward with things. This clip is. 
And the last principle, <laughs> pardon me, the last principle of um, universal design for learning is providing multiple means of action and expression. So give learners options for demonstrating their understanding of the content. <clears throat> so that could be giving them a choice of assignment options. Um, maybe you've always asked for people to submit an essay. Well, maybe open it up to them. Um, maybe let them choose how they want to deliver. It could be a PowerPoint presentation or it could be um, a short video. Um, let them choose how they want to explain things to you. Um, if you're using quizzes, which is quite common, especially in online learning, use different, <laughs> pardon me, use different types of questions. So true and false, multiple choice, fill in the blank. Don't just make it a whole 25 set question of true and false. That's not helpful for people. Give them different um, types of questions to answer. So we're going to put this to the test. What's your favorite kind of quiz question? I want you to use the Zoom reactions to tell me what you actually like. If you prefer true or false, use the clapping hands reaction. If you like multiple choice, use the thumbs up. And if you like fill in the blank, use a heart. <coughs> and I'm starting to see reactions floating up. And multiple choice seems to be the winner by a long shot. That's really interesting. And that's curious. I wonder why that is. Okay. Thank you for that. Fill in the blank is not very popular, I don't think. <clears throat> okay. So we're getting near the end. <laughs> Pardon me. Provide. So how did I use this? I talked about UDL, but how did I actually use it myself? So providing multiple means of engagement. We had the opening poll with Mentimeter, which failed, but it was an attempt. Um, we used reactions just now to get you engaged. How did I use multiple means of representation? I had images that matched the content. I provided video transcripts for the videos that I showed. <clears throat> and how did I provide multiple means of action and expression? I used different types of media. So I had some of them were images, some of them were video, and use this concept of scaffolding. So scaffolding is kind of like building one lesson on top of another. So I told you what we were going to talk about, we talked about it, and I provided you with different ways of um seeing what that looked like or what that was like in practice. <clears throat> and this has been mentioned before, progress over perfection. I'm not perfect. I don't get everything right. I've, I, I heard myself giving this pre presentation and using words that I probably wished I hadn't used or described things in ways that I hadn't, but I made an effort. I, I tried to do as best I could I tried to incorporate as many things as I possibly could um, to make this a more engaging and um, hopefully um, educational session for you. So my question back to you is, what can you do to make your lessons more accessible? And on that, questions. Happy to take questions from anyone in the room. Hey, Sandy. Thank you so much. Um, awesome content. I'm uh, wishing that the educators that I'd had when I was in school had followed approaches like this. I think both I and a lot of my <laughs> classmates would have been a lot more successful um, in, uh, in actually absorbing real information, but thank you. That was great. Um, we've got lots of good questions in the Q&A, um, so we'll tackle them as we can. Um, okay. A question from Faye. Um, are new <laughs> captions better than auto-generated captions? Uh, I know custom captions are the best, but a lot of clients aren't going to do it. So it's either auto-generated auto or nothing. Thoughts? Uh, well, I'd say auto is better than nothing. At least it gets um, gives people who need them some sort of context. Um, 
in, in no captions leaves them with nothing. What do they do? They, I don't think uh, artificial intelligence can help them yet in auto-generating captions. Um, you're not going to get them to upload a video to YouTube to get it generated or get them to sign up for service. So <clears throat> I'm not sure that nothing is the answer. Um, it's like the progress over perfection. It's progress. It's better than nothing. It shows that at least you put some effort into it. Um, and maybe you can slowly convince people that, yeah, take the time to do it. I mean, yes, it's work. Everything's work. Um, you just make time for it in your scheduling. If you're putting content together and you know there's going to be video and you know it's going to need to be captioned, put that in your schedule. Make the time for it. Um, and then it just becomes second nature. Um, question from Sambor, uh, do you have any examples of tools like Hemingway app for languages other than English? Ooh, no. And that's a very good question. <laughs> Not that I know of off the top of my head. I would think though that Word, because it's got the accessibility checker in, it's got the reading level checker in, if you're using it in your native language, it's, that might be an alternative for you. Um, and certainly chat GPT or any of those AI tools can be a good source. As long as you're asking the right prompt, um, they'll, they'll help you get closer. They're not going to get you perfect, but they'll get you closer. And the other, that just that whole idea of um, another language. And you, we forget that not everybody that's listening to us or reading our content speaks the same language as us or that's their native language. <clears throat> and it's particularly important in a learning institution where you've got students from all over the world. Um, you can't assume that they're gonna understand everything that you deliver in your native language. So plain language helps. Um, translation tools can do a better job of translating into somebody's um, preferred language if the language that you're using is plain. So there's a, that added benefit as well. Yeah, that's a great call out. Um, uh, how accessible are platforms like the, uh, sorry, the question from Ron, uh, how accessible are platforms like Learn Dash and Talent LMS, or is it just, just dependent on the content? Oof. Okay. I don't want to, I don't want, okay. don't want to get into trouble or platforms get anybody like. else in trouble. Platforms like, so the only way you're going to know those platforms are accessible is do all the things that a lot of the other presenters have been talking about today. Get real users testing them. Um, yes, uh, to a certain extent, if like something like a Learn Dash is dropped into an accessible theme, you're getting closer. Um, but having developed a couple of learning programs using something like a WordPress plugin, an LMS plugin, um, they're not great out of the box. Um, they're not great in the back end for anybody who's got to manage the content <clears throat> and get it in there. They're also not great um, for somebody who's, who's using assistive technology um, and going through the process. Um, we had many users testing and we had to, at the end of the day, really simplify um, what was out there in order to make it work for people. So out of the box, Mm, probably not going to be accessible. You're probably still going to need to do some work and you're certainly going to need to get end users involved to see what works and what doesn't work. Yeah, and, and uh, I know that VPATs are a useful tool mm -hmm. or uh, accessibility conformance reports are a useful tool in that search, yes. but you always have yes. to. Um, test, test, test. <laughs> Um, uh, someone anonymous asked, do you have any recommendations or resources on how to effectively describe images? Resources. I think that's more of a, um, it's a skill you have to develop. So it's something that, um, I think it's a bit of an art form personally, <laughs> pardon me, getting over a cold. Um, it's, uh, I guess somebody once described it to me as this, um, try to describe it, to, like you were describing the image over the phone to your friend. So if you can describe it in a couple of sentences, then you're probably good. Um, whether there's, I, I'm not familiar with specific resources that talk about how to write accessible text, 
um, or alternative text. Um, <coughs> but I do know that keeping it simple, keeping it short, keeping it descriptive is really what you're going, going for. And the purpose of it, if you're trying to describe an image that's just kind of fluff, it's there to fill in a space on a page, then maybe you don't even need the image at all. Same thing with PowerPoints. Do you really need an image on every slide? If that slide doesn't need an image, don't stick something in there just for the sake of sticking something in there. Um, it, it needs to add value. So sometimes I think that even that curation of content um, can make a big difference down the road. Yeah, um, I, I love so, somebody said in a talk earlier, um, uh, describe it like you're describing it to your grandmother over the phone. And that kind of infused the care and attention to outcome, like uh, empathy and care for, for the outcome that I really, I really like thinking about that way. Um, yeah, that's I'll, good. Yeah. I'll also quickly plug a talk that's coming up later today uh, by Carolyn uh, DeRosier, um, Alt Text in the Age of Automation, How's It Actually Going? Um, I think folks will get <laughs> some interesting insights on describing alt text and, and tools that do that well or not from there. Yeah. Uh, question from Jennifer. Um, uh, hello from Cool Way Sports. Uh, should every social media post have a description in English and French? <clears throat> oh, she's a fellow Canadian, I'm guessing. Um, I, I, I'm going to say that's going to depend on your audience. If you are um, speaking to a bilingual audience or you're a national organization and you're speaking to people on social media in both English and French, then yes, I think you need to have it in both languages. If your audience is predominantly English or predominantly French, I shouldn't assume, <laughs> um, then you could probably, you're probably fine to just write your alternative text or your descriptions in the language that your audience uses. It's one of those things that um, we come from a marketing background, our company, it's it's know your audience. Who are you talking to? If you don't know who your audience is, is it becomes very difficult to give them the content that they need. If you know your audience is, is English and French speaking, then give them both. Great, thanks. A um, uh, question from Kareen. Um, what about, uh, I'm not familiar with the <clears throat> I'll remember the context for this question. Uh, she she said, "What about saying above or below? That's probably wrong too." Um, well, yeah, it's not ideal. I get you know, it's trying to describe things on a screen. Um, which, like you, you need to provide context for people who can't see the screen, right? Um, left and right, top and bottom. Top and bottom is probably better because content is read top to bottom. Um, you know, it's very linear. So if you think about your content being linear, um, I don't think you're getting into trouble. I think where people get into trouble when they say things like left and right or top and bottom is that they don't provide any additional context around it. <clears throat> so you could say on one side of my screen, I have the picture of the cat taking a selfie. And on the other side of the screen, I have my text editor um, showing the code. Um, doesn't matter really if it's on the left or the right in the grand scheme of things. So it, it could be just as simple as doing that. Um, it could be on, you know, instead of saying the top or the bottom of the screen, you could say at the beginning of my code, there's this. And, you know, 20 lines later, there's this. Um, so it's just, it's subtle and it's not something you have to do overnight. It's just trying to listen to yourself talking. And when you start listening to yourself and hearing what you're saying, you catch yourself more often than you realize and go, ah, that wasn't great. I need to redo that next time. Yeah. yeah. As long as you're aware and paying attention, um, that's, that's, that's always step number one. Yeah. Uh, question from Sam. When building a course with uh, an LMS in WordPress, uh, would I stay away? Uh, should I stay away from using an accordion to hide or show lessons and transcripts? Uh, if the accordion is built in an accessible fashion, I don't think there's any issue with using an accordion. <clears throat> it, you get into trouble when you're using plugins and widgets and blocks that have been built for WordPress but haven't been built with accessibility in mind. That's where you get into trouble. I would say that if you are going to use an accordion, make sure that um, 
the question or the topic or whatever it is that um, is part of the, that's visible when it's not uh, exposed, make sure it's clear. So if your accordions are, um, an FAQ is an easy one to describe it. So you have an FAQ page, um, make sure the, the questions are what are visible before the box opens up. Make sure those are clear. Um, if you can make them so that they are headings, that's great. If you make the, the FAQ questions headings, then it's great for somebody who might use a screen reader to just navigate through the list of headings. So there's nothing wrong with them if they're done properly. Great. Um, I've seen some website, uh, question from Joshua. Uh, I've seen some websites <coughs> they include accessibility options, quote unquote, uh, where users can choose the look and feel of the web pages on the site to better suit their needs. Is that better, do you think, than trying to make your website as inclusive as possible, where you can <coughs> cover all disabilities at once? Yeah, I think that's um, a personal preference, I would say. Um, I'm all for doing it right from the get go. So it's and it, and it marries in nicely with the whole idea of universal design for learning. Universal design for learning is intended to make learning good for everybody. Um, like I said in, in the presentation, we um, all learn differently. We all need different ways to learn. So if you're building accessible content, an accessible WordPress theme with accessible content that's well structured, well organized, your theme colors are appropriate, um, you don't have bells and whistles happening all over the place. Um, I'm not so sure that those accessibility options are going to make that much more of a difference for the end users. Um, and some people could argue that having all those extra options can become clutter and can be um, too much information for some people and can become a distraction. So there's this, there's, it's, it's a balance, right? Um, I think if you can build out a site with content, whether it's learning content or a regular website that works without making those accessibility options available, that's great. Um, and use your accessibility statement to talk about things that maybe are not perfect or that you're still working on. Um, and always be available to provide additional support to a user that needs it. Maybe they you've done everything you could possibly think of to deliver an accessible um, learning program, you've used all the concepts of UDL and still it doesn't work for somebody, you're, you're going to be dealing with that. There, there's almost, it's almost impossible to avoid that. So um, I think it comes down to personal preference and what your audience needs. If you've got people coming to you time after time after time saying, I want those accessibility options, then put them on. <laughs> but if, if they're not being used, then maybe you can get rid of them. And I think it also depends on how those options are being injected. Like if they're being injected yes. in JavaScript or if they're actually built into the semantics of the site. Uh, yes. Again, progress over perfection, but some solutions that do that sort of thing are yeah. actually step backwards and make it worse. So I would say always make sure you're testing with real users to see if those options are making it better for them or worse. Exactly, yes. Um, question, anonymous question. Uh, do you ever post a presentation after the lesson uh, to a website and then how do you make it accessible? I'm not sure. I, do you ever post a presentation after the lesson to a website and then how do you make it accessible? Ah, okay. So I think this is the question. When I used to teach at Mohawk, when I first started, it was pre-pandemic. So we were in class. <clears throat> then of course we moved to online learning the lectures were being recorded via Zoom. We'd have Zoom classes. Um, and then after the fact, they would be captioned. And when they were captioned, they would go up on um, the platform, which I can't remember what it was at the time. So yes, they were, they were made available. And there were students who would ask, is it up yet? Is it up yet? Because they want to go back and they want to review it. Um, they may be taking notes. Um, they may have missed the class. They may have to go let the dog out in the middle of, of the, the important part of the lecture. <clears throat> so yes, um, that was very much a habit of what we did, for sure. And I think even for something like this, I know you guys are, are <clears throat> um, recording, you're going to have a captioned, you're going to have it available for the attendees. And that's great, because it's hard to focus for 24 hours, <laughs> number one, and retain all that information. And there's some presentations that would be great to watch again, 
Um, so why not? Why wouldn't you? Hi, Christina. <laughs> Sorry, attendee. I used to teach. <laughs> um, uh, anonymous question. I think we've got time for one or two more. Um, uh, and thanks for all the great questions, everybody. Um, is it best to use captions for describing images on social media over alt text in Instagram, for example? So captions versus alt text. Captions versus alt text. I, I think okay. I think maybe inline image descriptions in the body ah, versus okay. using the alt text feature. Okay, so I am not a social media expert guru or user for that matter. So not my area of expertise. Um, I think that I would use both, to be honest. Um, I would use, if, if the social media pr platform provides <clears throat> the opportunity to add alternative text, add it in. Maybe you don't make it as descriptive and then you put the, the, the fuller description in the body of the post. So that, that's what I would do. There is an excellent resource out there called accessible, I think it's accessible-social.com. Um, and it, she's absolutely amazing. She is the guru of accessible social media. And if you live in the world of social media and you want to make your social media posts more accessible, that is the place to go. Um, I'll see if I can find that um, after the conversation and I can drop it in the chat for people. But th that's where I'd go. To. She's, yeah. I bow to her. <laughs> Second, yeah, that recommendation, she has a great pocket book as well. A uh, little, yes. little pocket-sized pamphlet that's awesome. Yeah. Um, okay. Stuff. I think that gets us to our time. Um, thank you, Sandy. Thank you, everybody, for attending this great session with Sandy Gowder. Um, you can continue the conversation in chat or in on social media using hashtag WPA11YDay or hashtag WPAD2023. Uh, we'd also appreciate it if you go back, uh, go to 2023.wpaccessibility.day slash feedback to provide anonymous feedback to our speakers on their presentations. And you can enter to win a t-shirt while you're there. Uh, stay tuned for CSS plus accessibility inclusion through user choice coming up uh, next with Carrie Fisher at uh, 8 p.m. UTC. And while you're waiting, don't forget to visit our sponsors' web pages to grab virtual swag and enter for a chance to win great prizes. See you all right back here after the break. Thank you to WordPress Accessibility Day 2023 sponsors. Platinum sponsor, Equalize Digital. Equalize Digital's Accessibility Checker plugin is an automated accessibility scanning tool that helps WordPress websites become and stay accessible. Platinum sponsor, Gravity Forms. Gravity Forms is the professional form builder that you need to create beautiful, powerful, and accessible forms. Gold sponsors, 20i, DQ, Empire Caption Solutions, Pressable, and WP Engine. Silver sponsors, Code Geek, Drake Cooper, GoDaddy, Lone Rock Point, NerdPress, Overnight Website by Kinetic Iris, Riola Networks, A11Y Collective, and The Blogsmith. Bronze sponsors, Accessicart, Green Geeks Web Hosting, Hall Analysis SEO Consulting, HDC, ITX, IvyCat, Metabox, Pixel Chefs, Simply Schedule Appointments, SiteGround, Termageddon, Underrepresented in Tech, Weglot, and Yoast.